Ready? Let's go. Yes. All right. Uh, welcome back to Closing Bell. Um, looking forward to today. We've got, we've got uh, I think, what will be a really interesting conversation. Uh, let's dive in. Trey, you want to update us on, I guess, who our esteemed guest is today uh, and what things have happened since last week? So our esteemed guest this week is uh, Dr. Tom Reardon. I would imagine a lot of our viewers probably had him in class. Uh, he's got a pretty popular undergraduate class that he teaches, and he also kind of pops into a lot of graduate curriculums. Uh, there's a reason for that. The guy has published a bajillion papers. He's probably the most cited person in our profession, potentially. Um, his, uh, so I put up some numbers cause I thought it would be a good excuse to explain to people what Google scholar numbers mean. Uh, so Tom has an I 10 index of 255. So that means he's published 255 papers that have been cited more than 10 times or 10 times or more. Um, so for That's context, about what you have, isn't it Trey? Well, you know, self sites, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, for, for context, I think, Alex, what's your I-10 index? Uh, yeah, it's, it's up there. It's pretty high. I can't exactly remember. <laughs> it's, mine's a nine, so I'm happy with nine. But, uh, you know, 255 is, uh, it's like talking to Babe Ruth. So we're really happy to have you here. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, kind of a lot of international stuff, especially with the development focus. But uh, before we go kind of down that road, um, I kind of want to point out a few things that are going on in the world. Um, we talked a lot last week about vaccines, um, and I, I happened to stumble upon the coronavirus vaccine tracker, which is something the New York Times puts out. If you're, uh, if this is a like kind of a top concern for you, which frankly it probably should be, um, this is going to give you at least some data on what's going on in terms of the the phases that we talked about, the approvals that we talked about. Um, we have one that's been approved for limited use, so that's happening. Um, there are more than 165 vaccines that are being developed right now um, along varying levels. Uh, so again, this is, um, it's not clear exactly when we're going to have some type of vaccine that we'll be able to distribute um, across the world or across the country. Dude, um, I'm, I'm confused by these numbers though. Okay. Uh, and you're the wrong person to answer my confusion, but let me just say my confusion. I can BS my way through it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll use my warm milk to get through your BS. But all right. All so right. last week we had Felicia Wu on, uh, and and she was talking about our the first uh, of the vaccines that made it through to phase three, and then I think over the week I saw the the vaccine from Oxford and AstraZeneca that has also made it to, into phase three. But I don't know, where are the other ones coming from that seem to be as far along or, or further along? Uh, yeah, Fair enough. good question. <laughs> okay, uh, so. <laughs> so so that there is a ton of data on this website and I could probably just pull it up and show you some, some things, but, um, but also just if you're watching and you're really concerned about like, kind of where these, these uh, vaccines are coming from, there, they, uh, there are some really good links from the New York Times. Um, it's, it's something you might want to bookmark even just to kind of see how things are progressing. Um, but yeah, or just email Felicia if she knows everything. And we don't have to really just nice. lie to each other about it the whole time. We've got enough, I think, interesting stuff to talk about that we, we can do. move on from there. Okay, so... You two guys remind me of the car guys on NBR a little bit. <laughs> what are the, the what are their names? Uh, Alex doesn't watch it or listen to anything unless it's Harry Potter. Harry so Potter, yeah. Was one of their um, names Albus Dumbledore? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, in mask news, um, we have seen this uh, kind of incredible uptick in uh, acceptance of masks. Uh, there has been, uh, so um, Nicole Olnick, Widmer, and Courtney Beer, are they just published a study, or it's in review at least, um, where they made a really nice, beautiful infographic about um, kind of what current perceptions of mask wearing are. And uh, believe it or not, uh, regardless of what your Facebook thread makes it look like, 83% uh, of Americans actually believe that masks have a role in U.S. society in response to COVID-19. So, you know, they're... 
it doesn't mean that everybody thinks you should be wearing masks all the time. But according to their research, 83% of Americans think you should be wearing masks at least sometimes. Um, so I do wish I wish there promising. was a way. So yeah, because of you and this extension stuff, I've had to get a Twitter account. Uh, and um, my friends on my Twitter account are really different from my friends on my Facebook account, where my friends on my Facebook account are those people that I grew up with. And there is such a divergence of um, messaging across those two things. I wish there was a way to collect some data uh, to see the accuracy of these surveys and how those mass match up to the messaging on social media. Well, I mean, I think Facebook is a classic example of selection bias and Twitter for that matter. But, um, you know, it's your, there's an algorithm that's selecting what you see. So I remember last Christmas, um, there was, uh, one of my, uh, one of my friends was complaining because all of a sudden there was a drowning uh, in their hometown in her hometown. And all of a sudden her whole thread, her whole Facebook wall was full of other drownings from across the country. Jeez. Um, and so like, I mean, yeah, drownings happen, but like, it wasn't like there was a massive rash of drownings. It was just that the algorithm was selecting information to, to thought, feed in I based on what, that's what she was into. Been reading. Yeah. So I don't know, but it's an you know, thing. Um, the, uh, president also has kind of come out fairly strongly now in, in support of mask wearing. So I, I think, uh, that's, that's promising. Um, one, I thought a really interesting op-ed that ran just this morning in the Washington post was advocating for Trump masks. So, um, you know, you can buy Trump steaks and there are Trump casinos and Trump hotels. Maybe, maybe a Trump mask would be another way that we might be able to get some folks to wear masks. But even without that, like I said, you know, 83% of Americans, at least according to this research, are in favor of wearing masks at some point, uh, which is promising. Hasn't turned the tide on my Facebook, but I'm, well, I'm hopeful. Yeah. Also, there's probably a rural urban part to that because we're both from kind of more rural places. The sticks. Yep. Um, okay. So there is uh, a lot of conversation that's going on right now. This is uh, an editorial that ran just yesterday by a couple of kind of famous ag econ folks. So Vincent Smith is, um, he's at Montana State and Joe Glauber is at IFPRI um, talking about these, they call it a blank check to use uh, government farm subsidies. Um, so what's happening right now is, is the, uh, there's, they kind of found a loophole in this uh, Commodity Credit Corporation Charter Act um, where the administration basically has a check for $68 billion to spend as they, they kind of see fit in terms of supporting um, the uh, agricultural economy in the United States. Uh, this, of course, is, is kind of layered on top of the trade conflict. Uh, the, uh, the current annual spending cap is $30 billion, and it's been there since uh, 86, so this would more than double that. Um, and so this, this is a really interesting editorial if you're looking for something to read that, that might challenge your kind of way of thinking on, on public policy. Uh, both of them are, are affiliated with um, uh, the AEI, which is the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Vince is the ag uh, coordinator, I think, for, for AEI, uh, which means that it, it's actually a conservative think tank. It's a very famous conservative think tank um, that's been around for decades. So this is coming from a conservative outlet um, at some level, which is, I think, very interesting. Well, uh, what? You're saying it's coming from a conservative outlet, so we would expect it not to be against? Right, you know, kind of. I don't know. Uh, you know that, I mean, people talk about like the, I mean, the Trump administration is a Republican administration. Um, and the advocacy piece here is, is saying that, you know, you should try to put constraints on a conservative administration from a conservative think tank. I think that's a little bit interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's a fiscally conservative think tank. And so this is fiscal conservatism. It doesn't surprise me. I think so. Uh, Jim Hilker, we were talking with Jim Hilker, uh, a week or so ago. And he said one of, in this same vein, one of the most important questions uh, within agriculture policy today is how do we wean uh, agriculture off these massive subsidies? I don't know if Tom, you have any experience on that in sort of an international um, context. Well, what? I mean, you certainly, an example that comes up uh, is the New Zealand lamb uh, industry that uh, before when it was really quite dependent on subsidies was not very 
efficient, was not very strategic, was not very flexible, uh, didn't try to get out and really market. And um, as the food industry changed, <clears throat> those <clears throat> gaps in their abilities became big liabilities. And then the government, uh, because of fiscal reasons, cold turkey cut the subsidies to the lamb industry and they also had lost some of their favored status selling to the UK um, it, you know, from the Commonwealth uh, inheritance. And <clears throat> with those shocks, the, the lamb industry could have either gone down or gone up. And you know, they, instead they pivoted, <clears throat> which is similar to kind of the points we'll talk about today with COVID and the strategies of firms. They pivoted and became really marketing oriented, very flexible, far more efficient, uh, really listened to the client suddenly for the first time and became a dominant player in many supermarket chains in the world with New Zealand lamb. And so I think that, um, you know, I don't know if every time subsidies are cut, sometimes subsidies are cut and the industry doesn't react and doesn't take it as an opportunity and instead falls apart. Other times, you know, the subsidy is holding back the industry from modernizing and becoming more efficient and listening to the market because they're, they're already happy with the subsidy. They have a cushion and so they don't get lean and mean and, you know, get uh, flexible. Um, and uh, so, so sometimes I think that holds them back. I just wonder about the the lean and mean and flexible story, and we're jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit, but the lean and mean and flexible story of, yes, that's a good thing, yes, that's a good thing, yes, that's a good thing, and all of a sudden when we think about the trade-offs between uh, efficiency of production systems and resilience to these massive shocks. Uh, I wonder if some of that, like we've seen in the meatpacking industry in the U.S. Uh, and kind of around the world, if some of that lean and mean efficiency um, comes at the sacrifice of resilience. So, so is there this argument in favor of, of these subsidies to give us some of that padding? Well, I mean, if you think about, and that's a fantastic question, I think. It, the, um, uh, it depends on what you're subsidizing. So if you're subsidizing uh, port uh, upgrading or you're subsidizing road upgrading or um, you know, other things like that that are going to be assets that are available for resilience when the time comes, then you know, the subsidy gives you something in your pocket. If it's subsidizing recurrent expenditures and, and is just a buffer uh, for normal business, then uh, you might not be building a basis of resiliency. If you're subsidizing smaller firms uh, to, to upgrade so that they can uh, mitigate risks that come their way or weather shocks that come their way, then you can also hold your industry together. So I think you could make a case for a differentiation of types of subsidies in that, in that way. How about types of countries that are offering the subsidies? So I think the classic example to counter what you're saying is the Norway example, where they have uh, kind of massive price support plans, is my understanding, um, because of the fact that if they didn't, uh, there would effectively be no agriculture in Norway, which from an efficiency perspective, I think makes the complete sense, right? Uh, Norway is not the place we want to be growing crops, raising livestock. But at the same time, the argument that I've heard is that, well, when World War II came around or some disaster came around uh, and all of a sudden those international markets, like long supply chains are gummed yeah. up. Yeah, coronavirus, exactly. Uh, then you're sort of screwed in that in that globalized context you, you know I mean I agree with you that the idea of an insurance mechanism um, and trying to establish some uh, activity base uh, if you think about their salmon industry though uh, maybe the the base goes way beyond just uh, something that's available as self-sufficiency it becomes a global multinational enterprise um, so uh, you, you can think that you could you could kill two 
birds with one stone. You can subsidize in order to have minimum capacity, but then encourage those activities that are, you know, have the initial investment to get much more efficient and reach beyond the borders and become an active force. You could say the same with Denmark with, with uh, pork production. Or you could think of Chile. You know, Chile is a situation where, um, you know, it isn't so much recurrent sub subsidies for operations, but big subsidies put into infrastructure facilities, upgrading, you know, packing plants, and then it goes from a pretty sleepy or non-existent, um, you know, fruit industry to a global power. Uh, so trying to kill two birds with one stone rather than just establish something as a self-sufficiency or as a stopgap stop could be there. Can I, can I just ask one more question, Trey, and then I promise I'll shut up and you can keep doing your news updates, which is I just get worried about that story, uh, Tom, in that it gives a lot of, um, relies heavily on the, abil the government's ability to predict who are going to be those, uh, who are going to be the innovators and able to compete on uh, world markets and who are those that need protection uh, or, or insurance uh, because they couldn't exist in the ab ab absence of these support mechanisms. I just worry that it sort of sounds a little bit central plannery when we know that central planner isn't the uh, best mechanism to send these um, information signals. I think, I mean, I totally agree with you in one sense. Um, in another sense, if you do, and it, it depends again on how you do it, because if I'm thinking of Chile, um, and I was lived in Chile and, and worked somewhat with the Ministry of Agriculture, is that <clears throat> there, uh, there, there's a, a very tight partnership between the private sector and the government in, in making these sorts of plans. Um, you know, really, the Chilean government was obsessed with listening to what the private sector needed in infrastructure where they thought things were going to go, where the opportunities were opening up. It was clear that um, with um, the inventions of, um, you know, some cold chain within containers in ships in the mid-1980s and the rise of demand for off-season fruit in the U.S., you know, everybody felt the next step is going to be southern hemisphere complementary supply to northern hemisphere in the fruit industry. So the government and the private huddled, thought about what does that mean, and put in place the, the needed expenditures. If the government had said, we'd like you to be doing rutabaga, you know, or cauliflower, you know, uh, shipments to Cuba or something like that, um, it, that would be one thing where the demand wouldn't be there and the supply didn't make sense. But it was huddling together that partnership that was essential. Well, so, okay, so I think this actually ties into this slide here to me, because the, this is from like a really good FarmDoc article that was published, I think, yesterday about kind of the history of U.S. public policy on agriculture. Um, so this figure, uh, the black line is a net return with farm payments uh, in terms of an aggregate net return. Um, and then the red line is a net return without farm payments. And if you'll notice, um, where that dotted red line drops the lowest, uh, you see uh, the federal government making up, a, or taxpayers making up a lot of the, the slack. Uh, now, over this same period of time, as everybody knows, we've seen kind of a hollowing out of the middle of agricultural firms. Um, so Eric Belasco has a really good paper in AEPP, I think he's got some co-authors too, about who is receiving a lot of these insurance payments to, to try to prevent some of these farms from, from going under in these bad times. Uh, and if you look at it, it's oftentimes the largest firms that receive the most payments. Now that does make sense to some extent, but you know, it makes sense particularly from a resiliency, like we would need to maintain um, high levels of production in the United States. It might not make so much sense if you're trying to kind of preserve these smaller firms that might've gone out of business otherwise. Um, you know, over this period of time, we've also completely changed the way we subsidize agriculture uh, a few times over, I would say. Yeah, the, I think that story is is sold as is much more simplistic than it really is, where the this hollowing out of the middle of, of agriculture in the U.S. And we say we've got these tiny small farms and then the large producers. 
my limited understanding is that those small farms are not actually farms at all. You know what I mean? It's a, it's an artifact of the definition of farms. So in that sense, it makes a lot of sense to me, both from an economic efficiency point of view that the large farms would be getting this, but also because of the fact that the large farms are actually are the, the producers farms. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that actually have sales. Right. Um, yeah. And that's true. I, I don't remember what the percentage is, but there was a shocking percentage of farms in the United States that, that don't have any type of agricultural sales. Um, so I, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of supporting the industry, it is kind of interesting to think about how the United States has done it versus other countries. Um, yeah, that New Zealand case is, is obviously very different, uh, particularly for an industry that, um, you know, wool is such an important part of New Zealand. <laughs> Um, that, uh, that you would think that they would continue to try to sub subsidize it to protect their industry. So, I don't know. I think that was out of, well, I'll let Tom answer that. <laughs> yeah. No, just to, I don't know about wool, but the, um, I've had it pulled over my eyes, but, you know, so far. But <laughs> I, I think that one fascinating thing um, that relates a little bit to our, my discussion today is that the, um, you know, you have subsidies that are used to pivot an industry. If you, and, and um, so, there's, so there's sub subsidies to just keep it status quo, and then subsidies that are strategically used to, to uh, pivot an industry. And if you have the combination of helping the middle ground uh, firms or even the small firms pivot at the same time that you lead the whole industry uh, or, or help the industry to lead itself to have more stringent requirements that are more consonant with what the world market is requiring, then you have a win-win situation. I'll give an example from Brazil with dairy, basically, um, and, and contrasted with, um, it's actually like the Food Modernization Act in the U.S., but in Argentina, they said, well, the small guys are not going to be able to uh, make um, an adjustment to quality and safety requirements of the modern market for dairy. So we're going to give them a lower standard, a legal lower standard, just like, you know, farm markets, farmer markets in the U.S. And then secondly, uh, for those who are going to be engaged more in the world market or the Mercosur market, they have to meet private standards that are actually equal to what Nestle is, um, is requiring so that we're going to make a convergence between our private our public standards and suddenly ratchet them way up to the private standards to push our industry to be competitive globally. Okay. And Brazil did that where they just said they went from public standards that let everybody sort of clunk along. And then they said, well, we're going to lose in the world market as well as even the regional market. So they, they went cold Turkey and they adjusted their public standards to be at the level of the private standards. It's much more difficult. Uh, you know, of Nestle and um, uh, Danone and these kind of people. And that then allowed them to be more competitive. And the idea was that then they would have transitional funds and subsidies and, um, you know, other kinds of um, shifting mechanisms to allow medium firms to come up to the bar. Uh, of course, there was still a loss of a lot of smaller firms, the same in the 1908 or whatever it is, food safety law in the U.S., when it was imposed. Uh, many, many, many thousands and thousands of small and medium enterprises immediately went out of business. The industry concentrated, the dairy industry concentrated extremely quickly in 10 years. 80% of the small businesses across five cities, main five cities in the U.S. went out of business with the Food Safety Act. And the same thing in China and other places where they, the imposition was there, the, uh, they knew that there would be a kill-off of many small firms that couldn't make the needed investments. And so I think the, the industries that wanted, the countries that wanted to have less turmoil in the small and medium enterprises, less civil and political turmoil, and also have a larger supply base be pulled along with the, with the change, countries like Chile, then combined cold turkey on like Chile Gap, which where they tried to make the public standards and what the Ministry of Agriculture was imposing and working with farmers on equal to what the private standards were in the world market. At the same time, they intensively trained and helped uh, as many as possible to jump onto the ship and be part of, this, uh, part of the solution. So competitiveness plus help 
was a nice combination. You know, uh, if, if, it, if it can be strategically designed in, with private industry and government thinking it through together, that's the best. Dude, Tom, I, I, I desperately want to um, believe you and agree with those points. Um, <laughs> A, a few a few arguments that are not quite letting my mind be convinced. The first is the subsidy argument you've given is a kind of a classic story in the international trade literature, right? Which is the infant industries argument, which is if you've got this small industry, um, it'll be competed out if we let it um, compete freely with the open market, but if we kind of shield it or we give it some subsidies uh, to give it some time to grow, then it'll be um, able to compete and you've got Korea cell phones or, or whatever other example. A really hard part of that story is that at least in the US, when you've given, when you've given somebody a subsidy, when you've given somebody a benefit, it is really, really hard to take that benefit away. So the, the economic soundness of those arguments, I think at least in the US often are um, really, really at odds um, with those, uh, the practicalities of, of subsidies and the political economy of subsidies. I mean, I agree with you. Um, if it weren't the way that the countries I mentioned had structured it so that if you just say you get money, you know, here's the money, uh, there's no strings attached, no goal. But instead, what they did is they say, okay, here is tough love. Here is the new set of requirements of the world market that we want to become competitive in. And if you want to play ball in that market, you get a subsidy to upgrade. Otherwise, you know, you don't just get a subsidy to continue to exist without upgrading. Uh, so in a sense, it was, uh, it was directed subsidies towards a strategic goal of having all ships or all ships that wanted to rise with the tide and become and make the whole market more competitive so i think it's an in-between position between just handing it out for nothing or not giving anything in cold turkey it's in between and to what extent is that um i guess protection or government government support in the so uh, again, the, the Brazil, Chile world is really, really different than the U.S. world where um, credit markets, financial markets work really, really well in the U.S. And um, at least when some of these changes you're describing have been made, some of those, there's the kind of the classic market failure story. I wonder if we're talking in the, in the U.S. example, to what extent could some of those upgrading things um, be achieved through traditional credit markets? versus what we've seen in, in Chile and Brazil, like you're talking about? I mean, your point is fantastic in the sense that where you have the credit constraints, you, you need those subsidies. The U.S. has Small Business Administration and uh, many, many other programs that, um, that are loan guarantees, they're risk reducers, uh, there's matching. There, there are gradations of helping the private credit sector step forward on riskier deals and smaller scales that have some uh, have some justification, uh, even in a situation where, in general, credit is available. The idiosyncratic market failure of some small firms, you know, trying to get credit but not having uh, collateral or not having the the um, the path the the um, track record already available. Uh, but wanting to get into it requires some, um, you know, some help at the margin, but less than in a situation, I mean, more, less than in a situation where uh, the credit markets are not even there to use. Trey, have you got thoughts here? So, but well, okay. So this, this, I keep thinking about coronavirus land because like, <laughs> you're like, stop uh, arguing about economics. Why don't no, we no, talk no. about what we're talking about? <laughs> no, I, I think, I think we're, we're, we're getting into this. So this is about coronavirus is the, the thinly veiled argument for this policy. Um, so, so we have, at least in the United States, a fairly well-developed agricultural system. So we're trying to identify these innovative moments in agriculture in the U.S. is, I think, going to be increasingly difficult without some type of massive technology infrastructure. Um, so 
you know, hemp is, is one that comes to mind. Uh, you know, people thought hemp was going to be kind of this next cash crop. Uh, there are a lot of folks with a lot of rotting hemp right now. Um, and, uh, and it was because, yeah, potentially there wasn't enough investment in the, uh, the hemp supply chain infrastructure, uh, maybe from a federal perspective or from a private perspective, it just didn't happen. Um, and so I, um, well, what I was going to throw up. So I start thinking then, oh, there were a couple other things I wanted to point out for what happened this week. Taylor Swift's new album came out uh, and also Major League Baseball started up. But the third tab here okay. is the one that I actually want to talk about. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a piece that was just published a couple of weeks ago by, by Tom and Yos um about resilience and innovation in supply chains in coronavirus world. Um, and so it's a fantastic piece. Uh, Tom, love to have you kind of talk through it. But also I would like to be, I'd be curious to hear where these like resilience innovations in supply chains um, can be supported or how they might be supported with some type of subsidy policy. Any thoughts? Well, can you talk about the, the piece first, I guess? Well, I can go through a couple thoughts related to the piece and as I go, I can try to uh, loop back to the subsidy question. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think that um, a first point that really, really links to what um, Alex is saying and, um, and, and the whole idea of um, preparing oneself for shock my, my first point is really that, uh, and I'm giving examples of where countries or industries did what I think are, are smart strategies to deal with the COVID situation. And the first one that really uh, links to what we've been talking about is where there's been prior intense investment in research, in safety, and quality control systems like phytosanitary uh, programs, um, and also building into the culture and the mindset and the institutions and the associations of the industry a flexibility and responsiveness to shocks and new requirements. Okay, so, uh, you know, an example of that that I was just mentioning that I had a lot of experience with was in Chile, where the private sector association, really strong, really united, and the government very responsive to that association, built up, you know, over the past 20 years, phytosanitary uh, systems, and then protocols for uh, the farmers in the country, as well as handlers and processors and packers. And these, protocols and these quality systems were really, really informed by uh, what the world market wanted, okay? And so if you're upset, we'd like you now to slap on a new set of tests or a new set of uh, bands or a new set of you know, quality requirements. The answer was yes. And because I did a lot of work with fruit and vegetable buyers around the world, you know, in supermarket chains. Uh, and I would always say, who's your favorite country in the world uh, in terms of suppliers? And they said within, you know, a half a second, they said Chile. I said, why? They said, because their answer is yes, 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 yes. Okay. And so they're constantly listening, constantly asking, what is the, what is the market requiring? Even if the market comes up with some crazy new thing, uh, they, their answer was, yes, we'll respond, we'll shift our protocols, we'll get our members behind this, we'll do it. And so the supermarket chain said, wow, that is one headache less. Chile, Chile is up to the mark. And I was just thinking South Africa is another case because they have, uh, in the coronavirus thing, you know, they've done really well. And I talked to, you know, that industry, and uh, part of it said, because they put together a phytosanitary system and then, you know, helped members to understand that it was necessary to invest in it, not that much subsidy, but more, you know, really clear information about what was required. Uh, that system was set up and then the members all 
ascribed to it, like in Chile, and then they were beat up a lot of times. So the, from their point of view, the Europeans, like the black spot disease, that wasn't even a problem in Europe from their point of view, and, and they would lay on the crazy requirements to do this and do this and do this. And each time they would say, yes, okay, let's just do it. And they, they adjusted. And so when the coronavirus thing came and there were additional requirements of traceability and tests and requirements, it was just part of their normal culture of their association to adapt. And so that really seemed to me like a central good practice, building up the muscles by being beaten up by the world market and its requirements constantly and adjusting and pivoting and adapting and mitigating. And then when another thing hits you, then you're ready for it. Okay. Can, and, I, can I ask a question about that? I'm sorry, I, I'm interrupting really? you, but I'm just, just uh, fascinated by what I'm seeing as a huge contrast uh, of America, where you're, you're saying um, the higher, the more rigorous, the higher, the more rigorous, the food safety standards, the food regulation, the more flexible these people were able to adapt to this changing situation. Where, I mean, Trey and I have been, went, been talking about this in the American context. Um, when we saw in the U.S. this massive shift from food away from home to food at home, from food service, restaurants to grocery stores, um, a whole bunch of people were freaking out because what they ended up seeing was a lot of uh, vacant shelves on grocery stores, right? And part of the story there, again, I think there's years and years of research yet to be done here, but part of the story, I think, uh, is that s these regulatory standards, these food safety standards in the U.S. Um, were such that they created an inflexibility in terms of the uh, uh, producer's ability to shift from kind of a food service supply chain to a grocery store retail supply chain. Do you see that as a difference or is that kind of the same argument that you're making, Tom? No, this is a fantastic point. I think it, it, it also links to another one of the good practices I was going to say that, um, and in fact, I see them as really now linked points, is that the, the successful businesses that I've been uh, seeing were really able to pivot, okay? And I think it's your, your point. And, and why were they able to pivot? Uh, they were able to pivot diversifying end markets or shifting end markets. They were able to pivot by shifting the supply sources. They were able to pivot by substituting new ingredients. They were able to pivot by um, doing new standards and new protocols that uh, you know others might have balked at and thought were crazy, but they just said, fine, we're, our mentality is you know, change with the market and pivot. And so uh, they'd have a backstop approach for new products like CP, Chara Popcorn in Thailand and feed business. They'd move, you know, they had their networks that they were working across. Uh, there would be backstop approaches for labor use, substituting to make mechanical sources or where they were getting their labor. There would be pivoting in terms of reassembling and repacking and resending and reorganizing and remanaging uh, the supply chain, shifting from restaurants to homes. Uh, and so I saw this in very many, many countries, Unilever, um, and in essentially looking for where those opportunities. So that, that mentality of flexibility, um, you know, uh, and, and pivoting and responsiveness to the market was reflected in standards and protocols that were not rigid. They, they were rigid downward, okay, but they were not rigid upward. So that if, if you think about it in the Chile case, the South African case, they said, we are totally flexible to what the market's going to ask for. We're, we can flip our, stand on our head, we can flip, stand on our elbows what do they want but they were used to then ratcheting up their standards and their system and their organization as a function of whatever the hell they uh i don't know sorry for using that on your podcast that whatever they uh the, the market threw at them they were ready for and i think that that flexibility uh you know comes from really understanding that the nature of the market out there the nature of the market is private standards the nature of the market is, um, you know, strategic, constant repositioning. 
so that if you don't stay relatively more efficient than your competitor, relatively as efficient or more efficient at flexibility in responsiveness, then you're, you're, you're knocked off. And it could be that the bigger the country you are, with the more assured the market, the more you become, maybe you could say complacent, uh, because you feel like things are not gonna shift that much on me, I can adjust to it and defend the status quo. While these countries that I'm talking about have something in common, they're small, right? And so if you think, wow, we're a small Chile, we're small New Zealand, we're small uh, South Africa relative to the market, they have to be lithe, they have to be uh, fast on their feet and, and flexible, and they have to keep their standards high but adjustable. And so my argument that I've made sometimes speaking to American businesses is that you know, my beat is not uh, extension as much as trying to share what I see in world markets sometimes to American uh, suppliers. Um, and I feel that where American suppliers take on the mentality of an underdog, of a small country, of a hungry, flexible firm and country, they succeed well. You know, where they come and think, we haven't made, we already did what's necessary, we're already dominant, often their lunch is eaten. So I, I've got a, a thought, and maybe this is crazy, but the, so you mentioned a couple things. So one of them was private standards as opposed to federal standards, I think. Well, he um, said alignment between private and, and public standards. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the other thing that comes to mind is, so of these countries we're talking about, um, labor costs are so much lower that I would imagine that there's less technological investment. <laughs> um, so, so when I think about like the egg story, right? So, so Shaver and I are working on a paper about eggs and how uh, you saw this massive spike in eggs. There were some kind of regulatory constraints that were relaxed and we saw the price come back down. Um, part of the story there though, is that it takes a lot of money to invest in the egg supply chain for restaurants that is not so easy to convert back over to the egg supply chain for grocery stores. Uh, now, if it was like a, like low cost labor that was actually like, you know, handling the eggs by, by, by person, uh, you, you probably would be able to convert that over pretty quickly. Uh, but because it's a, you know, million dollar investment to be able to convert this over, I, I, I kind of wonder if the United States is just doomed to be less resilient in the, in these quick transitions. Well, I think, yeah, the, so Tom, now you got, you got two people picking on you, <laughs> but, but I think it's uh, this, this litheness that you talk about and this, we're doing a little bit of this and we're doing a little bit of this to me from a U.S. perspective uh, seems like a hugely inefficient thing, right? So now I've got to have the, I've got to have the regulatory compliance for two different supply chains or the packaging capability Better for hire two some different supply lawyers. chains. Yeah, it just seems, uh, I totally take your point for kind of middle income countries uh, and their response to international markets. Uh, I'm just curious whether you envision kind of this story um, holding for the developed world as well. Yeah, this is a fantastic question. I think that um, several points here. Uh, one is that uh, uh, my points about South Africa and Chile uh, are, I think, valid for the U.S. I always remember going with Michigan farmers uh, to a field trip to uh, fruit and vegetable industry in Chile. And their main comment was, wow, this is more advanced. The, the, the players, the main players of this are more capital intensive higher technology, larger and more advanced than anything we have in Michigan. That's wow. their, main, their main point. That I quote them. Okay. What, what, was the, what was the crop y'all are talking about? Well, it's fruit, the fruit industry. Okay. Okay. And then the same thing, Brazil, uh, the same group then went to Brazil. They look at a 200,000 acre farm, completely technical, you know, technical, technified, not, it wasn't a labor advantage. And in the farms in Chile, they were using already picking machines and harvesting machines because labor had become way too expensive. And so you have those examples. Then you have New Zealand that has this, as I mentioned, New Zealand, uh, I'll never forget. I was in the Kiwi farms in Zespri and I said, wow, uh, you guys have an extreme labor shortage. 
um, are you going to go for robots? And they said, we're going big time for robots because we, we can't even get labor now. Uh, you know, it, 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 they come in on a visa, a labor visa for picking, and then they immediately go into the service sector. And so the key thing is, is that if you really look industry by industry, you know, you find a lot of situations where um, the industries that we're talking about are completely competitive with the U.S., in not, not just because they have cheaper labor. In fact, labor is usually not uh, their source of competitiveness. It's mm -hmm. often, you know, mechanical advantage. They share the same knowledge base. A lot of times, for me, they've made investments in associations and protocols um, that, that have really put them in a good space, okay? And uh, they're in joint ventures. Let, let, let's say if you think about hortifruit in Chile um, with Michigan blueberry growers in, in uh, Michigan and Nature Ripe in California, you have this kind of alliance. They're all operating at the same level of technical and competitiveness and modern and modernity. Okay, so I think it's not really that, um, you know, I could, I didn't give examples of Nigeria and other cases so much that I'm working on also because I thought they would be a little less interesting um, in, in more examples where these would be equivalent with the US. The other side is that for me, there's mitigation and there's coping, okay? There's kind of prior investments and there's scrambling around after the fact. And an example that I really um, like to think about is Chatham Popcorn. Ch CP, based in Thailand, is one of the largest agribusinesses in the world, okay? And uh, they have feed operations, you know, all over the world now, uh, et cetera. And they, you know, were already pivoting uh, before this crisis and diversifying their sources, building redundancy into ports. For example, they would build three different seaports at different lengths of, from the sea so that when there was a typhoon, uh, they wouldn't be uh, destroyed because they had the largest rice operation in the world in Thailand. You know, so they would be building in redundancy in their infrastructure because of the climate change and the shocks. And they had to do that because they were constantly facing droughts and typhoons and at a level and variability that they hadn't faced before. So it's the same thing. Droughts and typhoons is one source of variation and risk that you build your muscles around. Having Europe change its pesticide requirements and its quality requirements all the time, that's another form of muscles that are built by the Chileans, okay? And so when you look across the industries, and many of them are in situations where you have to put a lot of money up front, often it was strategic money, it was strategic uh, associations, strategic remanagement of the way they work so that they could deal with one set of shocks and then they were ready for the next set of shocks. I, I just, so, so, what you're saying is those that were, well, I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth. Are you ready for the words to be put in your mouth? Sure, fire away. <laughs> okay, so what I think you're saying is those that were facing a high degree of uncertainty before were prepared for uncertainty, right? With the EU regulations changing, with the tsunamis. Whereas in the US, we try really, really, really hard to make stuff as certain as possible with respect to regulations, with respect mm. to the way the market works, uh, which in good times is a really good thing, right? I think it's hard to, hard to argue that um, reducing uncertainty is a, is a bad thing for producers. Uh, so to me, it just seems a little bit like maybe what you're talking about is, is um, almost luck, right? The fact that, that um, because of these people um, facing a lot of uncertainty, they were more able to respond to the uncertainty. Well, it's not just, so the luck thing is also, in my mind, I keep thinking like, okay, so we're talking about these market signals. These market signals just don't fall down from on high. You know, it's not like, like God just like tells us how these markets are going to respond. You know, um, GMO uh, free yogurt is going to be a thing before GMO free milk just because of the consumers that are in GMO or in yogurt. Uh, you know, it's not abundantly clear to me where these market signals are coming from. And so I feel like there has to be a trial and error piece that, that it's possible that U.S. growers maybe aren't 
ready for. Uh, I mean, I think about like a path dependence thing when it comes to growing. I mean, anybody's ever talked to, you know, a family farm, they talk about how their dad did it, how their granddad did it, how their great granddad did it. Um, and that, that really sets the tone where what you're talking about is being ready to pivot all the time throughout this growing system. Um, so do you think the United States is even capable of, uh, I, I really love, no, I love what you guys are saying. I was going to say that in a way, you know, the image that came to my mind because it's sort of related to your vaccine points that I like at the beginning is inoculation. So that, uh, you know, uh, inoculation I, I've been reading actually was an African medical treatment from several thousand years ago uh, that eventually, like for smallpox, it was eventually used in Europe. Uh, and the, you know, when you know you could get a disease, you take a little bit of the disease on you and get strengthened to face it. And so if you completely, it's just like, you know, people say, don't let your children lead a completely sterile life because when oh, they- I see where and, you're going, okay. Yeah, yeah, when you're faced with uh, some germs and you've been totally, totally, you know, in a bubble, then you're gonna get sick immediately. And so in some ways, governments don't do a real favor if they, if they completely uh, shield and buffer their farmers and their you know, businesses from the world. The second point that I would say um, is, I, I don't know, I mean, um, think about some of the leaders in the world. I'm going to name a non-U.S. firm that's just coming to my mind, but I could name U.S. firms as well, um, that, um, you know, where they're really already doing this. Okay, so, and I could name many U.S. firms that are doing this. Um, like Michigan Blueberry Growers, you know, and the Nature Ripe to me is brilliant. And, you know, they're thinking ahead. They're already, is, it, you know, uh, they're even using the experience of their partners that built up that inoculation. They use that as part in their joint venture to really uh, propel themselves forward. Uh, so <clears throat> sometimes the joint venture or partnership with those that have been knocked around a lot teaches one, one thing and the other teaches another thing and they're together stronger. Another point, though, is the product cycle. Um, that if you think about <clears throat> niche commodity, actually the, the blueberry example is a good one for this, niche commodity uh, and, and, and differentiated product. And you think, okay, back in the 1980s, nobody in the United States ate blueberries, basically, except in Michigan, you know, sort of. And then in the 1990s, 2000s, it became, you know, quickly introduced and became a commodity. And then in the 2010, the smartest firms <coughs> started to differentiate their product and <coughs> build up um, you know, all kinds of new varieties and take on new joint ventures and change their product. So they pivoted. And so that sort of scanning for the opportunity to go from a commodity where you're not making that much money, it's commodity, bulk commodity, to differentiating the product with new attributes and new markets is a mentality of all of the front runners. If you think of Nestle and you think of nutrition, okay, the, you know, Nestle is making all these, and Kraft, they're making all these sweets. They don't spend their time, you know, putting advertisements out saying, it's not so bad if you eat a lot of sugar. Instead, what they do is they say, we're gonna own the space of health food. And they begin differentiating and trying to commoditize healthy, uh, convenient products, healthy sweet products that have less of certain kinds of sweets, so that they can already be the front runner. They they taste and smell. Where is the wind? Where's the wind moving in the market? And they go where it's uncomfortable in order to be a front runner there. And I think there's plenty of American firms that are doing that. So it might be the difference between those that are those kinds of frontier and uh, creative and entrepreneurial uh, firms that are putting themselves in harm's way, in the line of fire, in also in the line of money. And then uh, others that might have been protected and not bother doing that or want to be protected and not want to do that. It's a business decision, it's a mentality decision, it's a cultural decision within the industry and the place. And so I, I don't see Americans as, you know, homo homogeneous in that sense. I think that it's a heterogeneous country with a lot of people 
with that kind of uh, uh, will to get out there and inoculate themselves uh, to the real world of the changing market. Can I just ask one, that was, that was very eloquent and poetic and you wrapped it around with your inoculation thing, uh, which is super cool. One thing that I cringe a little bit at is the idea of your statement, willing to put themselves in harm's way. Uh, which I think you can take metaphorically as you're using it, but I think you can also take it um, literally in, in some really scary senses in that um, I, I think there have been firms, there have been industries that have put their workers uh, in harm's way quite literally um, to the uh, benefit of profitability or, or, or maybe at least the um, shielding themselves from some costs um, in ways that are really potentially exploitative to the workers. Yes, I think this is a fantastic point. I, I think that, of course, what I meant by harm's way was more the rough and tumble mm -hmm. of the world market and the fact that it's constantly changing that, uh, you know, the example that um, was given, I remember, by the, uh, the cherry researchers at Michigan State University that came to my undergraduate class and they were pointing out that uh, Michigan had owned uh, the tart cherry industry globally and then suddenly there were some uh, bad years and Germany was investing in Poland and suddenly Poland pulled ahead of the of the Michigan uh, Michigan sector and so there's the rough and tumble there's always somebody there that can quickly eat your lunch Guatemala owned the berry industry. Then they sent some unhealthy berries to the U.S. They were knocked out of the procurement system of supermarkets for one or two years. Mexico jumped right in and, and supplied clean, ready berries. And Chile ate their lunch, ate Guatemala's lunch, etc. You could give many examples of this. And so the point is, is that the rough and tumble means that you have to get out there and duke it out and be as flexible, as quick, as competitive, as all of these people that are rising from different places, and any time that you begin thinking Americans are naturally and normally front runners, then usually you fall. Okay, mm -hmm. so keeping in mind that you're equal to all these people, and they're all trying to buy. That's what I meant. Now, the other side of it actually was another point that I was thinking of here is that a lot of the best practices <laughs> that I'm seeing, for example, Unilever is doing this and I could name a bunch of other Swiggy in India that's doing it to its food service and restaurant uh, guys is they say okay we, we need the golden goose to stay alive I, I don't want to put it that crassly but if you say um, our clients our customers our suppliers our workers are all investments that we've made <clears throat> if all of that falls apart we have to reinvent it that's the non-humanitarian version of the humanitarian point, which is I got we you. don't want yeah. people to, to suffer. So you want to, you know, there's, in, in many of the cases I've seen, there's busing for laborers, there's personal loans, there's, um, you know, loan programs that Swiggy does to its restaurant um, clientele in India to keep them, allow them to upgrade and start again. So <clears throat> there's a lot of startup costs that you incur if you don't treat your people well, you have to retrain, you have to refine. Often skilled labor is extremely scarce in those places. Maybe cheap labor is there, but skilled labor is your big, uh, is your big constraint. And uh, you're going to find skilled labor far more easily in the U.S. than in Cote d'Ivoire. For you know, that was the story that Olam was talking about with its cocoa that they were having a heck of a time finding skilled labor to upgrade and and, and upscale. And so. The point is you have to make your investments in skills, in safety, in hygiene. And then also the, uh, you know, it's interesting, the Swiggy example, which is like a restaurant app, you know, uh, in India, they actually um, then use it as a marketing device, which so does Unilever. They say, we treat our workers well, we have high hygiene, we support our suppliers, and then they sell that image along with their brand on the app and in the advertisements, and Unilever is doing the same. And so I think the companies that really will benefit in the long run are those that are doing good. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of saying the, the usual. How much of that is cheap talk? 
It's easy for me to say I treat my workers well, right? It costs me nothing to say I treat my workers well. No, to it's what true. extent do they have to back up their words? I think time will tell. I mean, I totally agree with you that uh, that's why you need regulation. You need private standards within the industry. You need government regulation. You need oversight. You need muckrakers. You need people watching, uh, you know, because all the time these things can be uh, cheap words. In every domain, pesticide use, uh, many, many things. So you have to combine a state that's willing to, uh, you know, hold people to account and businesses that want to do good in order to do more business and uh, businesses that are competitive. I think the combination is central. And the people, the consumers need to live in order to spend. And, you know, we want them to live anyway. I happen to be one. <laughs> But consumers need to live in order to spend. Wow, that is a cynical way to to conclude this sucker. <laughs> no, 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 wait. Don't, 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 don't let that be on my gravestone. Uh, yeah, I think but I think this is this has been extremely interesting, insightful, mm -hmm. and it was fun to uh, debate a little bit about this stuff. You guys are fantastic. I've never been. I never. I mean, I don't. I, I, I've, I've given up praise uh, in my life because I'm now 65. So there's a, you, you don't, uh, there's a law that says there's no n need to praise anyone anymore after 65. <laughs> so, but what I say is you guys are fantastic at, uh, at this, uh, this closing bell uh, because you're, you're both extremely informed. Uh, you're, you're both, uh, you know, rhetorical giants and, you know, kind of debaters. And at the same time, you really care about people. You know, you really care that things come out well for the consumers, for the business, for employment. So your heart is there, okay? And, uh, and then you, you really lead a speaker. I learned a lot from your questions and your points. So I'm extremely grateful to be on this. I, I really uh, uh, praise you. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks so us. much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. That's nice words. I'll, I'm just going to drink and cry in my beer a little bit because I feel <laughs> good now. I so, thought you were going to say, uh, say words are cheap, you know. <laughs> that's well, that right. too. <laughs> You're so exploitative, Tom. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. It's been a fun one. Um, have a great weekend, and uh, I guess we'll talk next week. Thanks again. Stay safe. Thanks a lot, you guys. Take care.